Um, so um, one thing in microarray days, uh, last year we, we started the course with expression microarray, but this year we started with RNA-seq. Um, with microarrays, people do normalization quite a bit. Um, actually, now with RNA-seq, if you use salmon or RSAM to calculate the TPM, the normalization is done already. And so this, you don't probably need to worry too much. Um, but I kind of just want to very quickly go over what kind of uh, the things that people do with normalization. Supposedly, you have some measurements on, on genes. Uh, each gene you have some number and uh, you are looking at two samples or you can look at many, many samples, right? Um, what are the, some basic things people do with normalization? The very simple thing you do is called the median scaling. So supposedly um, th this doesn't have to be uh, RNA-seq. It could be proteomics or metabolomics. You just have some numbers on a list of genes or a list of variables, right? And you're looking at the sample and you try to normalize. By the way, when we try to normalize, one important assumption we make is that most of the things, uh, most of the dots should be fairly similar between the two samples, right? You, you have to make some reasonable assumptions there. Most of the, 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 the dots should be similar between the two. And so if we were to look at this, uh, you might see that um, sample one has a higher median and it also has a higher spread. The things are just, you know, the range is much, much bigger. On the y-axis, uh, it seems like things are fairly correlated, but the mean is different, the median is different, the variations is different. So median scaling is just you, you subtract each sample by a scaling factor to kind of move their median to be the same and then you multiply by a, another coefficient so that these two are really on the diagonal then things will be kind of normalized then you can the numbers for the x and the numbers on the y will then be more comparable um, when would you use something like this for example in the early days when people are using uh let's just say if in our RNA-seq analysis, we don't calculate a TPM. Um, this first is a could happen, supposedly we sequence the first sample much, much deeper than the second sample. And then we just look at all the reads that landed on, that, on, on each gene for, from the first sample. You can see that it will have a big spread and also the numbers in general are bigger. And if you didn't sequence deep enough, you will get another, say another replicate and just have lower dynamic range of the other. And supposedly we don't have an algorithm like Salmon or RSAM to do the TPM normalization. A very simple thing that people initially tried, you know, this has been tried in early RNA-seq data, is you calculate the read that lands on each gene, you get this, you know, the number for each, uh, each gene on um, each sample, and you just do median scaling. It's, you know, like a, the reasonable job, but you know, I think for calculating differential expression, it may or may not be the best way. Uh, but this is certainly a, a potentially good way to try. Um, another one is called the low S, um, and you probably see quite a bit of this. Sometimes when you try to draw a lot of dots in the in the curve on R, um, the algorithm will automatically show you another line, which is kind of the best fitting to your data. Um, so, so low S is is a, a non-linear, it's kind of a non-linear smoothing, but you can see here, if the data look like this, each dot is one gene, and x-axis is one sample, and y-axis is another sample, uh, I, I would imagine for some of the metabolic profiling, you, you don't have 10,000 genes, you have a few hundred numbers, you might look, the data might look like this, right? So, and in this case, if we still make the assumption that most of the dots should be similar between the two samples that lie on the diagonal, we can also try to normalize this. And the way to do this is um, in each section, we try to divide the data into different chunks. In each chunk, based on all the data within here, we estimate a linear scaling approach, right? It's, and then we move to the next section, we do a linear, move to the next section, we do a linear, and we, when we try to connect them together, 
the, the, the slope of the linear changes, and that will give you kind of a nonlinear way to scale things. But at the end, imagine if you try to force this nonlinear thing into the diagonal, then things will be together. And there are standard R functions to do this as well. You just, you say, okay, I want to normalize the second sample to the first sample with the last, it will try to normalize them. Then the X and Y will be comparable. Um, for this one, you need a reference sample. You know, I'm, I'm normalizing my Y axis by the value of X. So you have to decide which one is the reference and which one I, I want to change, right? So in this case, um, yeah, so the original Y, we want to keep the same and the X is changed to X prime based on Y. Um, so in this case, we're treating the Y as the reference sample and then X prime with Y are more comparable. The difficulty comes when sometimes in uh, expression data, you don't know which one is a reference sample. You just have, you know, 10 disease and 10 normal. Which one do you use as your reference sample? It's difficult to find. And so another normalization method, which is really very widely used in biological system, is called the quantile normalization. Again, it assumes that most of the measurements, sorry, is don't change between the samples. Um, and uh, it, it does something like this. Um, so supposedly you have, you know, again, this big matrix, so, so each column is a different sample and each row is a different gene. What it does is we create an additional column and then um, in each row, we calculate the, the top percentile, the average of the top percentile from each of the samples. Um, let, let's think about uh, another example. Um, supposedly we want to look at uh, the, the, the GPA of say Ivy League colleges, but supposedly Harvard has very bad grade inflation. A lot of students have 3.8, 3.9 uh, <clears throat> GPAs. Whereas another school, mm, let's just say UPenn, I don't know, they, they grade very harshly, right? Um, and so their students never really have that high score. They, their, their average is 3.2. Right, so it's like yeah, the, the range might be different. The, the mean is different. The, the range is different. Can you use median scaling? You can probably do that, right? Um, but which one do you use as reference? And you know, you correct everything to Harvard or you correct everything to UPenn. Now you don't know. Therefore, what you can do is you, you get all the Ivy League schools together. You assume that that's a, yeah, that's an important assumption. You assume that students from all the seven Ivy League schools are the same. Right, and they roughly what percentage of students their top one percent, the, the Harvard top one percent, and the UPenn top one percent are literally the same level, right, on the same league. Therefore, what you do is you take the GPA of the best student, the, the top one percent student at Harvard, the, the, the UPenn and Columbia and Princeton or whatever, and you take all of their GPA, you average them together and create this top one percent student GPA. And then you take the top 2%, so from 1% to 2 you know, that percentile student from all the seven schools, you average them together, and then you create that average second percentile here, and then average third percentile, and average you know, 100 percentile. There's the worst student from every school average together. And once you have this, you replace the original data with the percentile. So if, you know, whatever this guy's GPA is, you don't care now. Uh, if it's the top one GPA student or the one percentile, I'm gonna replace it with the average from all seven schools back to the original data. And you just replace all the data. At the end, none of the matrix uh, cells retain its original value. But then this one, you are really forced all the different samples to have this, the same distribution because that's the, that's the distribution you calculated from this one. You, re, you replace each of the percentile with the average. And that's quantile normalization. So you can see here, we don't really pick a reference sample. We just say, okay, you know, this roughly, these are all similar schools. Their students should be the same. They should have the same distribution. Um, yeah, so then you, you calculate the, this overall percentile 
level and you replace the original data with the percentile. And so quantum normalization, uh, I, I would think nowadays, if you use uh, some proteomics data, metabol metabolomic data, it's you know, pretty good. Um, right now with the uh, RSAM or Salmon Callisto type of algorithm, you can probably get just the TPM score and it should be more or less comparable. Um, and you don't need to do this. Um, but then even after this type of normalization, there are still cases with uh, uh, a batch effect, um, which means that you, you, there might be some technical variations which are not really biological. So um, supposedly, um, if you do a cancer normal comparison, right? You, do, you did a uh, patient, um, all the cancer samples and all the normal samples, and you try to cluster them, so supposedly, let's just say you have, um, let's do something simple. You have uh, 20 tumor samples of the same cancer type. And then the adjacent to normal, because sometimes with surgery, the, the doctor take out a little bit outside tissue just to make sure they have a clean cut. They take a little adjacent to uh, normal tissue and you put both into the profile and they did say, 20 pairs of such patients, okay? And then after that, you do the normalization, you, sorry, you, you, you calculate the TPM and you cluster the samples. Uh, supposedly, these are all the same cancer type. What, how would you expect the samples to cluster? Yes. Would they all cluster together first because they're all from the same tissue? Uh, so basically you have 20 pairs of data, which is 40, 40 samples, right? 20 disease and 20 normal of the same, let's say breast cancer will be. Right, ideally you want the samples to cluster by cancer and normal. Um, but I can tell you, we have e examples where, you know, some groups were analyzing data, they are asking us to help them with an analysis of their data. And then no matter what we do, they, they are like said the data are clustered by two, two groups. Initially, initially, we just look at how the tumor samples are clustered and they are clustered in two groups. And we were wondering, oh, maybe the cancer are subtypes. And then, no, they are not subtypes. And then finally found out one group of samples were profiled in the spring, another group of samples were profiled in the summer. And so clearly there are some things that are not biological, right? And then we, we, we asked them, can you also put the normal samples in a cluster? Again, you see the normal and tumor are clustered together in the spring and the tumor and normal are clustered in, in the summer in a different cluster. That we will know it's, it's um, a batch effect. And you can see it can make the samples not directly comparable. I would say this is a pretty extreme case. Most of the time you may not see that strong uh, uh, clustering effect or batch effect. They could be pretty subtle, but it can still have a huge effect on your final um, differential expression analysis. And the, the way, the, the reason that we see this type of uh, uh, differences, uh, yeah, we mentioned the day and months of the experiment. Um, you might be using different reagents, you know, enzymes, buffers that you made or enzyme you bought from different lots of from the, even the same company. Uh, you might be using different mice. Uh, they may, might be hosting in different cages or you just bought them from different companies. Um, even at the, the final sequencing, well, yeah, so also the lab technician or the postdoc who is doing the experiment maybe is a different technician. Uh, then, then you will get different results. And even at, uh, at the end, after sequencing, the sequencer might be different. You send it to a different sequencing facility or something, they will give you a different result. So all of these can cause potential problems. Um, yeah, so uh, for, for example, uh, this is an experiment where people use RNAi to knock out, to knock down three different genes, so re kind of re reduce the expression level of three different genes. Um, and uh, so they, they have three petri dish or th three batches of uh, experiments in here. There's so a batch one, two, two and three. Um, and also uh, the, the, 
R and uh, C is control versus RNAi, whether you knock out the gene or not. And the third is uh, the, the cell clone. So each of them, they also had uh, a, a different cells, you know, like a dish. And so um, you can see in here, um, ideally what you want to see is that all the controls are together and all the treatment are together. But after you do the clustering, it's, you know, maybe control are a little bit more enriching here and the treatment is a little bit more enriched here, but there's just too many other variables in here. Um, it's, so you have to remove the batch effect. And I want to show another example. Um, this actually gets published. Uh, it's a very striking finding um, where um, the, the experimental group has done RNA-seq of many different tissues in human and many different tissues in mouse. And then when they run a PCA, so this is a three-dimensional PCA. You can see this projection now in three dimension. You can see all the human samples are circles and all, or balls and all the um, mouse samples are cones. And you can see, wow, it really separates. And the first principal component separates by human and mouse. And uh, the, the, the shocking results that's actually reported is something like, you know, if samples are really separate by animals or the, the species than by the organs, which means that, um, you know, the human brain is closer to the human heart than it's, uh, it's to the mouse brain. Uh, the reason this is kind of shocking is, do you know why we even do experiment in flies or a worm or, or, or mouse? It's because it's very difficult to do experiments in humans, right? You can't make them, you can't knock out a gene in human, right? It's difficult to do a lot of things in human. And we're assuming that mouse are more or less similar to human. Therefore, if we observe this thing in mouse in that tissue, it will recapture, it will you will recapitulate what you, or you, you will capture what you see in human. And if this conclusion is right, it would mean all the experiment that we do in animal models is a complete waste, right? Because, you know, what do you know about a human brain from mouse brain? You should take their human foot to do the experiment, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's pretty scary to think that after so many years that we would reach a conclusion like this. And then uh, a year later, um, you see this uh, being blocked and they look at this. Um, in this ex experiment, they sequence the RNA in different lanes. And in the first lane, it's all human sample. In the second lane, it's all human. Third, uh, sorry, uh, sorry yeah, lane seven and lane eight is all human samples. And lane four and six are all mouse, mouse samples. Uh, Fortunately, there's a different run in a different lane where they have some, you know, both human mouse, right? But after they have removed the batches, they, they know there are some variabilities that are captured in that batch. It's probably that technician or that sequencer or whatever. And finally, the tissues indeed cluster together. The human brain and the mouse brain are together now, and the, the you know, human heart and mouse heart are together. It's, it's actually kind of embarrassing that something so obvious, the computational biologists did not think about removing batch effects. So it's a, definitely a big deal. And so anytime that you have, say you do a the differential expression experiment, when you don't see enough differential gene expression, don't go to gene set enrichment right away. Remember previously we said, oh, after you do DEC2, you correct for multiple hypothesis testing, you have you know, a few hundred genes differentially expressed, you're happy. But uh, actually, even if you have a few hundred differentially expressed genes, you might want to double check to make sure they are not complete garbage, right? Um, you you want to make sure, and, and also if you don't have enough differentially expressed genes, before you try to do gene side enrichment analysis, double check your batch effect. And so there are definitely some important messages about experimental design. So better technology never eliminates the needs for better experimental design or good experimental design. Um, so 
first of all, easy case is we try to be consistent and process all of the samples at the same time. That will be the easiest case. But if you have to do them through different batches, you know, make sure, first of all, you try to run, you try to record as all these variables as possible. Uh, what's the date of the experiment? Where, where are the labs, the personnel? Because sometimes, um, actually, this project was done in a consortium setting in different places, right? Um, yeah, so the, you know, the personnel, the environment, all these variables, make sure that you have a record of those. And also, if possible, try to balance the groups of interest, at least include some controls in each batch. For example, if in each lane of samples, you put some human sample and some mouse samples there, that at least you will, you will have ways to uh, correct it later on. So try to avoid perfect the confounding experiment. When the batch groups are perfectly correlated, for example, if you do all of your treatment in one batch and all of your control in another batch, there is no way you can figure out what your control, or what your treatment is really doing to the cell because it could be the experimenter, it could be the cell culture, it could be the sequencer, and it's also part of the treatment. You just cannot tease them apart. Um, and so supposedly you do a tumor normal experiment. And if you take all the normal samples from one hospital and all the tumor samples from another hospital and you do expression profiling and you want to compare tumor normal, that will be a disaster, right? You will never know what's the difference between the two hospitals or the difference between cancer and normal. Um, yeah, so how do you really remove the uh, batch effect? So um, you can imagine, uh, supposedly, uh, by the way, I would say batch effect removal right now, there are some reasonable way to do it. It's not perfect because a lot of these batch effect removal algorithms were developed for microarrays. With RNA-seq, they kind of works, but I, I, we don't know for sure that they always work the best. So you just have to check. So supposedly uh, you have a big expression matrix. The columns are the samples and the rows are the genes. And we are saying that there is a baseline gene expression, which is you know, what you measure. It's kind of the average expression across all the samples. And then supposedly you are trying to estimate. Um, remember, if you are using Lima to do differential expression, you are saying, okay, these samples are tumor and these samples are normal. Um, and then we want to ask whether in each gene, so by the way, this is kind of the value you ask for each gene, is this gene differentially expressed between the tumor samples and normal samples, right? It, it, and you are trying to ask whether the coefficient is different from the null, from the, the average, right? And if it's a tu the, the tumor normal, that coefficient is significantly different, you will call it a differential gene. And so in this column, most of the values will be close to zero, but occasionally there will be some genes that is upregulated or downregulated, right? And, but you're trying to compare the, the treatment and control. Uh, of course, you're trying your best, but there are you know, all the small variations. There are some small noise that's associated with every sample, with every gene. So this one capture all the remaining small noises. Um, so in here, the primary variable is the treatment and control or your tumor versus normal. But imagine if you have another batch. Uh, so supposedly uh, the, uh, some are batch one, some are batch two. You can imagine the batch is another treatment because, because of the technician, because of the weather, the sequencer, the reagent or whatever it's creating another effect on all the genes in the cell. Well, not all the genes, but like some genes in the cell. Probably in a coherent way, you are trying to estimate how much is that. And uh, you can actually do this directly in Lima. And just remember, Lima can give you some complex designs. So we are saying, yes, there are tumor versus normal, but then we are also trying to estimate what is the batch doing to each of the genes. So you are saying, if, for example, if it's uh, batch one and batch two, um, then you estimate what is the batch creating the difference on gene one versus gene two versus gene three. So it's, it's going to try to look at all the samples in one batch compared to all the samples in another batch and estimate whether there is an observed slight differential expression between the batches. And you want to take that out 
before you compare the, the, the real difference between your tumor versus normal, okay? And so you can consider batch effect as another treatment. And if you know the batches ahead of time, you can remove it. Um, yeah, so intuitively you consider the batch as some kind of a treatment effect and you can use algorithm like Lima to, to remove it. Um, there are existing, um, so another algorithm that uh, can remove the uh, effect is called COMBAT. This actually works very, very well on um, RNA-seq and can capture even nonlinear uh, type of uh, variabilities. And it seems to work pretty well. Um, and so actually, how do you really even see or identify or correct the batch effect? Uh, the first thing we, is we need to first see whether there are batch effects present or not. And that's usually done by clustering. Um, you can do this also by PCA. Um, this is actually one example. If you have all the samples available, uh, each dot is one sample. You just run a PCA, you look at the result and see whether so in this case, it could be that uh, the samples are colored differently by the day the samples are processed. Or you can separate them out by all the tumor samples coming from one hospital and another hospital and a third hospital and so on, right? So if after you run the PCA, you, cl you clearly see that the samples clustered in a way that's corresponding to the batch, that's a very good indication that this data needs normalization, needs batch effect removal. Whereas if after whatever kind of normalization, the batches you are seeing is no longer separating the samples, so they are kind of all merged together, that's a reasonable indication that you are removing out the batch effect. Or it could be that you still see them clustered, but they are clustered in a more biologically meaningful way, such as all the tumors are here and all the normals are on the other side, and they are no longer uh, they differ by the, the date of the experiment or the uh, the hospital, right? Then, then you you know it, you have removed the batch effect. But, um, the, the the way to detect this is to do the clustering. You want to visualize the samples, for example, using log TPM. And in order to remove it, if you have some really simple batches, just two two condition, two days, right? Um, you can use you can actually also, uh, um, three days is also okay. Uh, combat can remove those known batches. If you know that there are three different days you process the sample. So, so supposedly if you're doing the experiment on cells or on mouse, you wanna do three replicate, it will be better that you treat the cell and get the treated and untreated in day one. You treat again in another, in another group of cells, you get the treatment control in the second day, and then a third batch, you do treatment control on the, on the third day. And then that you can use, definitely use combat to remove the batch effect. Um, for Lima, if you have more complicated samples, for example, recently we have some samples. Uh, initially it was the, say, uh, the, the RNA, uh, it's, it's uh, sent to three different centers. And each center also have different days. And also uh, the, the same tumor has freshly processed versus the uh, paraffin embedded tissues, even though they are coming from the same tumor. And so you can see it's kind of a nasty design. And we put them in all the different, uh, di three different labs, fresh frozen versus the uh, FFPE samples, uh, and also different replicates. And then you wanna do the clustering. For that one, we, we use something like Lima to really remove the complex treatment. So you are saying that the FAPE process probably did something to the tumor. Uh, each uh, sequencing center probably has another effect, and then each day will have a separate effect, and Lima can remove them all um, separately. Um, and then um, at the end, uh, you will get the batch effect removed log TPM value and that you can use as your gene expression index. And you can use this for uh, your other calculations for uh, gene expression. Um, and then to make sure that you have correctly uh, removed the batch effect, you might want to do a, a sample clustering again, either with hierarchical clustering or with PCA to make sure that the samples are now 
separated by the biological difference and not by the hospitals or the day of the experiment. Um, by the way, if you have simple batch, you can also use DEC2. Um, and, and also, so basically, a DEC2 now can, can do some simple batch effect removal. Again, consider the, the batch as another variable when you are trying to compare the sample between tumor normal or treatment and control, you say, okay, I have another variable, which is the treatment date right, or the batch. Um, and so this one will tell you the level of differential expression and give you the, the genes that are really different between the tumor and normal or the different conditions, but it will not touch the original expression index files. You will just get the level of differential expression with batch effect removed, but it will not, uh, it will not give you a corrected log TPM value. Whereas if you do Lima, you can get the corrected TPM levels at log scale, okay? So that's uh, the, the rough idea for batch effect. So PCA, um, sometimes you might do a PCA and the first principal component you can see, oh, it's a batch. That's a very good indication you should remove batch effect. And so sometimes, um, you may not know which variable is really creating the batch effect. Is the technician wrong or the reagent wrong or the date of the experiment or the mice that I, we bought from different companies, which one is wrong? So what you can do is for every sample, you draw a dot right on the PCA. And then you, you draw each variable with, you know, like say, if we separate it by hospital, draw them in different colors. Do we see them separate? If not, then it's okay, right? If you see, oh, it's really the, the data of the experiment, that the, the early versus late are now clustered, then you can use it to help you identify which condition or which batch really created the biggest problem. And then you can put that as a variable in DEC to help you remove that variable, okay? But this is definitely important. By the way, homework two, that sample has batch effect. You need to remove it, otherwise you will not get the correct differentially expressed gene expression. Okay? Okay, thank you. That's all for today.